Hello and welcome around to my house and Happy New Year to you all. Yes, it's our first show of 2023 and we're starting off the new year as we mean to go on. I'll be joined by one of the best known faces on British TV. We've got two world-class chefs in the kitchen and we'll be treating you some, to some incredible dishes that you've got to try for yourselves at home. All in all, it's the perfect recipe for a Saturday morning. So what are we doing out here? Well, the weather's nice, for sure. But let's get inside and let's get cooking. Are you coming in, then? Good morning, and what a show we got for you to start 2023. I'll be serving up two headline-grabbing dishes for news presenter and sports broadcaster, Dan Walker over here. Yay! He drops by the house a little bit later, and I'll be heading down the road a few miles to the local pub and took it into a classic dish from Lenny Carl Roberts, uh, Chef Jude Kirimaram, who will be treating us to a recipe that celebrates the best of Cornish produce. He's here again, so I'm looking forward to that one. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass. We'll be showing you everything you want to know about the seasonal pasta. And that's not all, because I'll be joined by the house by the most talented chef in the world right now. Well, certainly one of them, uh, from uh, his Lancashire restaurants. It's number two in the UK. It's Mr Mark Birchall! Yay! Now, congratulations, first of all. We'll have a ching-ching. ching Because ching, ching, you deserve that as well, because your restaurant fluctuates from <coughs> number one to number two, number one to number two, and number yeah. one to number two, and Chef Chef of the Year as well. Oh, that's amazing. It's been an amazing year, 2022, yeah. for you. Such a nice surprise as well to you know, be voted that by... My peers. Just exactly. Well, you've come all the way down from where your neck of the woods, which is up near Liverpool, and your restaurant. It's not yeah. very far away. Yeah, just... So, what have you brought with you? What, what are you going to be cooking for us? Oh, so, we've got some beautiful sea deer from the Isle of Purbeck. Yeah. With some beetroots and smoked marrow dressing. And it's, yeah, it's delicious. It's a, it's a dish yeah. that's right up your street. It's, yeah. it, it, it looks fantastic as well. Uh, but we're kicking things off today with a, a ceviche of sea bass. Um, and I'm going to show you and, and introduce this vinegar in a second. But first of all, I'm going to run through the ingredients for this. Uh, we've got a little bit of sea bass. You can use any fish for this one. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but any fresh, really, really good uh, fish straight out of the sea is what you want for this one. You can do this with trout even as well. This would work really well. We're going to do a nice little pickle. The dressing comes in the form of a little bit of uh, ponza that you make from soy, a little bit of the vinegar, some lime, some of this yuzu as well. And I'm going to incorporate that with a little bit of pickled vegetables. But the first of all, what we're going to do is prepare our nice little bit of sea bass. Now, for that, what we do is we've got a beautiful bit of bass over here. Now, when I had this, when I had it abroad recently, I had it slightly different. It was sort of charred on the outside and sort of ceviche in, in underneath as well. So what I'm going to do with this is just take, this, take the sea bass like that. That's for my tea for later. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice this into little slices. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not a great fan of the bloodlines, but I'm just going to take a little bit of that and get this nice and thin as we go. I suppose you do this on the, on the menu, don't you, at your place? A little yeah. ceviche, because it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, definitely, like langoustine, scallop. Well, I know you've got that, be that beautiful, uh, the, the, the sea cadir as well, but that's, I mean, that must be amazing in a little tartare, wouldn't it, and stuff like that? Yeah, definitely. Beautiful. Definitely. So yeah. what we're going to do is just take out a little bit. Now, I had this uh, while I was in Turkey, this one, but, and, and what they did in this restaurant, and they, and, and I'd never had this before when it was done like this. Usually with this, you just ceviche it, you put a little bit of the, uh, the lime and everything else on it. So you take, take your nice little bit of fish like that, put it on a tray like this, and before you sort of spread it out, what you do is you take the blowtorch. OK. And I've never seen this done, but it tasted really good. And you sort of char the edge. And it sort of chars the edge of it. You get this... Plus you get this barbecue sort of taste as well with it. Yeah, yeah, nice smokiness on that. Smokiness to it as well. And then what you did is then you take your nice little bits of fish, lay them out like that, and then put the lime and everything else over the top. And I thought it was really unusual. I thought it was really... It's yeah. quite an interesting... Yeah, it's sort quite of unique. Isn't it? Yeah, well, it is sort of thing. It's one of those things, as a, as a chef, we sort of think... Yeah, well, you don't know it all, because you only know about 1% of everything, don't you, really? And if you name that, you don't know it. But when you're sort of travelling around and stuff, you get to see these sort of things with a little bit of lime on the top, a little bit of oil, some salt and pepper. I just thought it was a wonderful way of just serving this little ceviche with this. But 
just a touch of fresh lime on the top. People are often put off by sort of raw fish, aren't they, really? But when it's, when it's pickled like this... Yeah, I mean, it's so fresh as well. You, you, know, you can't beat it. No, it's, uh, so you've got this lovely lime juice over the top, fresh lime juice over there. And then what I've done in this little, little pot over here, I've, I've blended a few little herbs. So if you've got any le herbs left over in the fridge, just blended with a little bit of veg oil. And one pack of sort of herbs will take all that veg oil, you blend it all up, you give it a good sort of... A good sort of 10, 15 minutes, just blending, blending and blending. You'll get it really, really smooth. And you can sit that on there. And I'm just going to leave that to one side. And that's just going to sort of marinate with a bit of salt, a touch of sea salt, and a little bit of black pepper. I'm just going to leave that to marinate nicely, just for three or four minutes. Meanwhile, where we do our little pickle to go with it. Now, the pickle, um, as you know, we started, well, way back, for COVID land, we're just in COVID land. We started to introduce to all these amazing suppliers that we have in this country all over the place. And, and this, I thought we'd start 2023, as we mean to go on, introducing some new suppliers as well. So I'm going to use this vinegar on here. I'm going to use this ginger vinegar, because I know you're a big fan of vinegar as well, so you can Absolutely. dive and have a taste of this. Uh, so we're going to go head up to uh, my neck of the woods, to Yorkshire, to speak to Andrew and Sarah Defu from the uh, Slow Vinegar Company. So first of all, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for being here. Now, tell us how it all started, because I found this, this... this Going into the food business is not your business, or wasn't your business before you are on um, where you are now. How did you end up doing it? I, I love this. It was it home brews at home? Home wine? Exactly that. Yes, we, um, we were making hedgerow wines, um, going foraging for elderflowers, elderberries, blackberries, and making our home-brewed wines. Um, and then we had a bit of a light bulb moment when one of them didn't work out so nice and took on a bit of a vinegary <laughs> taste and at this point we were like hang on a minute elderflower wine vinegar elderberry wine vinegar and thought well maybe that's something we could think about uh, developing a bit further and uh, so that was the seed of it really um and yeah then we sort of researched and experimented and learned the process a bit more thoroughly and developed this range of vinegars so the, the, the seed of all this was, a, was a, a batch of bad wine, bad homemade wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, explain the process how it all happens, because we've got a variety of flavours in a minute of, over here. We'll explain them in a second. I'm just going to make a nice little pickle that we've got in here. But explain to us, what, what if, it's like a Willy Wonka going on in the back of you, behind you. What, what on earth is going on behind us there? What, what is the process to making these different flavours vinegars? So, take, for instance, this ginger one that I'm using now. Well, how do you go to the process to turn this into, into vinegar? So, the, so we make the wine first. So we make a ginger wine, um, uh, alcoholic, quite, al quite strong. And then um, the, the way it's fermented the second time is, uh, is what's happening behind us in these sort of trickle generators. Basically, the alcohol is uh, being oxidised with some... Um, acetobacteria and the bacteria are turning the alcohol into acetic acid essentially uh, but because we've started with a ginger based wine um, we have a ginger based vinegar and then when when the acidity is correct then we take it out of these contraptions behind us infuse it further with some more ginger and mature it for another three to four months before it gets bottled so, so we've got a variety of different ones over here. What, what did it start with? What was, what was your first one? Because, you know, you've increased your range from then. What, what was your first one to where we are at the moment? Because we've got a big selection over here. I have to say my personal favourite has got to be the ginger one. I, I love that. That must be a big seller of yours, is it? Yeah. It is, yeah. We started with um, elderflower. That was our very first one. Um, and I think we once we've worked out that... We were going to sort of work through the year making different wines at different times of the year. Then the range just sort of evolved through through that sort of period. Ginger was is really interesting. We were sort of inspired by um, Sarah's late father because he always used to like a, a nip of uh, ginger wine. Um, so we sort of thought, well, it's delicious. Let's make some of that. And we ended up growing some ginger, actually. We had a really good crop of ginger up in Yorkshire, which is that was quite interesting. I eat this, this gentleman's got five, five acres at the back of his restaurant. You, you, people laugh at me when I say I grew my own ginger and I grew my own lemongrass. And, and we're, we're speaking here from Hampshire to Yorkshire, but you can grow that sort of stuff easily, can't you? Well, it's, it's, it's tricky, but it does grow. It did, yeah, it grew really well. It's... And it was delicious. Fresh, fresh young ginger is like... You, you can eat it like an apple. It's just tender and juicy and... 
But anyway, we made vinegar with it, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, you can actually grab. Um, so, so give us, give us. So we've got on here. We've got. We're going to have a little tasting session over here. We've got the ginger one that I've tasted over here. This, this is quite unusual. This, I mean, I love wild garlic, but how on earth do you turn wild garlic into a vinegar? Is it just the infusion with it? No, it's the same process. So we make a wild garlic wine, which um, isn't the best wine you've ever. Wild <laughs> garlic at wine. All. I, I, I'd yeah, love to go to a dinner party and you get the bottle of wine wrong when you're serving it. Get a wild garlic wine. <laughs> yeah, which is quite pungent, but um, once it matures, it sort of mellows out. And I think what you get from the wild garlic is a, a slightly oniony sort of uh, taste, and it's because the wild garlic is part of the Allium family, I think, and so there's that oniony back note to it. Well, I'm just going to just recap where we've got in here, because I can see, you know, Matt's got one eye on here, so I'll just lift out that, that lovely little bit of sea bass that we've got on here. There we go up there, and we just put this over the top. And what I've done with your, your vinegars, by the way, I've just made a lovely little pickle, uh, which I love with the different vinegars. And I've used three parts vinegar, uh, two parts sugar and a little pinch of salt and a little one part water. And then I've just taken the vegetables and all I've done is just thinly slice them and we just sort of pop these on there as a nice little sort of crunchy bit of taste, a bit of texture to go with this. So you've got things like the carrots, got with the little heritage carrots we've got in here as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, just nice and simple with the, the shallots in there as well. And then I've made a nice little dressing. Now, this is... I'd love you to try try and make a, 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 a vinegar out of yuzu. So I'm going to give you a little... Yeah, so yuzu is this thing that I've fallen in love with, really. It's been around for years. It's like this little citrus. It's amazing. Uh, it comes in these little bottles like this. But make yourself a yuzu wine and then give yeah. this a go, because this makes an amazing little dressing with the little bit of soy that's in there as well. And we just put that over the top of there. And then all I'm going to do to finish that off is a little bit more of this oil that we made, just a touch of that. And then a little bit of coriander over the top. So before we go and before you leave us, I wish you all the very, very best. It, it's the produce speaks for itself, really. No, it's I mean, you've fantastic. got, I love all you've got, the, the, you've already got the taste awards on there, and, and it's well deserved as well. It, it speaks for itself. Thank so you. best Thank of luck you. with everything, and Happy New Year to you all. Thank you, you too. You too. That, that recipe looks delicious. We'll, have to well give it next, next time I'm yeah. up in Yorkshire, I'll bring you. I'll bring you a portion. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Fantastic. You can make it with cod or addock, without the batter. <laughs> all right. So there you go. Well, best of luck. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Lovely to speak Thank to you. you. Look, and then we just got a little bit of chili over the top. Now you can use. You know, you can use this. I've got some of this Peruvian chili paste if you want, but I just think a little bit of green chili or red chili over the top like that. That's. Just enough for there, but there you have it. My little ceviche of sea bass. Not a bad way to start 2023. Easy as that. Bon appetit. <laughs> Chefy, there you go. Thank you so to, much. To, look at that. Lovely and fresh. Oh, God, it smells amazing. It smells all right, doesn't it? Oh, it's... Just a little taste. But I quite like that. When I was eating it, I thought, I love that idea of that charred bit that went with it. I just thought it was just really nice. It's, just... it's different, isn't it? It's delicious. It's different, it really, isn't it? Is, uh... Well, fresh fish ceviche, anyway, oh. it's lovely, but just with oh. that charred edge to it, I think yeah. it's just... It's so yeah. fresh and... So fresh and yeah, tasty a bit of and smokiness. Zingy. There. Yeah, it's lovely. There you go. Right, Mark nice. will be cooking for us a little bit later. And I'll be whipping up something very special for Dan Walker. That's coming up shortly. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, Lenny Carr Roberts will be inviting us into his kitchen, which is about a stone's throw away from here, in that direction. And he's treating us to a classic pub dish. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, there's a masterclass in parsnips coming your way a little bit later. And I'll be welcoming presenter and Strictly star Dan Walker 
into the kitchen very shortly. But before that, I thought I'd take a look at some of the dishes you've been making at home. And you guys have been so busy this year. Right, you can check out these. Uh, first up, we've got Daniel Martin. I was inspired by beef stew and dumplings that I made for Adam Woodya a while back in November. Proper comforting dish, oh, beef stew and dumplings. Lovely. Uh, nice work there. And next up, check this one out. Stuart mm. Garlic. Oh, wow. uh, has this amazing dish. Look at this photograph, this stunning pear tart stand. Oh, showing his knife off there as well. Yeah, exactly, showing his brand new knife. As, yeah, exactly. And, but the star anise really works, I think, with pears. Oh, yeah. there amazing you go. combination. There you go. There, nice little pear tart stand there. And finally, top marks go this week to Julia uh, Atwater, who made the pork fillets that I did on the show a while back with cider and mustard sauce. Now, I remember doing this dish when I was at a brasserie in France, working there as a young kid. Saute potatoes, cider, mustard, cream. It's one of those dishes you do at home. Yeah. You're cooking at home, you don't even think about it, but pork fillet, it's yeah. just... It's just beautiful, isn't it? without sauce as well, but it's so simple, it's just so easy. There you go. Right, on a serious note, there's been lots of stories in the news about how British pubs are closing in record numbers. You must know all this as well. It's, it's unbelievable. Crazy. And I think it's going to be a trend that continues. So over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be doing our bit, see if we can help save our British pubs. So to start with, I'm heading down to my local pub to watch Lenny Carl Roberts in action serve up a classic dish that you'll find on pub menus up and down the country. Enjoy this one. So when you think about pubs, Great British pubs, nothing better than the pub than steak and chips. It's one of the quintessential things you'll always see on the menu, steak and chips in most pubs. We do it slightly differently. We do this amazing Cote de Boeuf where it's big, but it's for two people to share. And we're going to do it with some really naughty comfy chips, a great sauce. So I'm going to talk you through how to cook this meat, also the importance of resting it, and then we're going to get the dish and put it all together. So let's get going. First of all, nice hot pan. It can be vegetable oil or rapeseed oil. This is a little bit of rapeseed oil. And this stage here of searing this meat is more important than the actual cooking. It's about creating colour on the outside of the meat. This colour is natural sweetness, natural sugars within the meat that are going to help get that nami flavour and make sure that it's absolutely stunning. So we're going to take our time, brown it on all sides, add some aromats, garlic, thyme, and some butter. And we're going to pop it in the oven for seven minutes. Then we're going to baste it, turn it over, and cook it for another seven minutes. The flavour comes at this stage. Show it some love and some respect. You know, the butcher's done a great job with it. He's aged it for 38 days, you know, on the bone. So by the time we get it, this meat is just prime and ready for cooking. You know, yes, it's expensive. It's a treat. But that's why you go to pubs, so you don't have to cook yourself. There we go, look at that, caramelisation. That equals flavour. Now, to that, we are going to add some aromats of garlic, some thyme, and a ridiculous amount of butter. And this butter will just foam. It'll take on the flavour of the thyme and the garlic, and that butter will just keep the meat beautiful and moist. We're going to put that into a hot oven, 220 degrees, for seven minutes. Then we'll turn it, baste it, and cook it for another seven minutes. Everything we cook, we cook to order each time, so you get that lovely freshness. That's what pubs have been doing for years. It's a fantastic way of cooking. You come in, sit down, relax, we start cooking. That way you can taste the freshness all day long. So let's talk about what we serve with this amazing bit of meat. So these are just potatoes that we slice very thinly on a mandolin. We then cook them in goose fat or duck fat for about an hour, around about 140 degrees. After that, we then press them overnight uh, between two sheets of silicone or greaseproof paper. And all we do with these, once they've been pressed and there's all the different layers of, of potato and thyme and seasoning in there, all we do with those is deep fry them. So we'll pop those in the fryer, and these will take around about six or seven minutes. So while those amazing chips are cooking, let's get back and turn our meat and give it a good basting. So that's had seven minutes already. I'm going to flip this meat. Look at that colour. Use the butter in the pan to baste. Foaming butter flavoured with garlic and thyme. And that can now go back in for another seven minutes.
So the chips are in, the amazing chips, the beef's in the oven, that's all coming on beautifully. Now let's make this sauce, green peppercorn sauce. What's better than a pub than a green peppercorn sauce with a steak? Fantastic. So, really simple sauce. A little bit of oil, nice hot pan, in the shallot. Again, we're going to have a little bit of colour on this. Again, we're looking for caramelisation on this sauce. Then we're going to add our green peppercorns and lots and lots of black pepper. You also need black pepper as well as the green peppercorns for this. Here we go. And I can smell the sweetness coming there of those shallots. And then we're going to add a little bit of brandy and want that to reduce. And I want to reduce all that liquid pretty much down to nothing. Now. Here we've got some of our fantastic beef stock. And again, we're going to add the beef stock and we want this to reduce down, to intensify the flavours of the beef stock, but also the peppercorns. As sauces reduce, they just intensify with flavour, and that's the beauty of this dish. Now, as that comes down, I want to reduce that by half. Then we're going to add double cream, and we're going to reduce it again a little bit more. And that's the sauce. It's a really easy sauce. It's one of the best sauces for steaks especially a lovely joint of meat like our Coke de Boeuf, which is going to be out in the oven in hopefully a few minutes. That's reducing nicely. I'm just going to add a bit of English, sorry, this is Dijon mustard to the sauce. That helps it thicken it a little bit, but also gives it a little sharpness. Now, that sauce, that stock is reduced now by half. Then we add our double cream. All that sauce needs to do now is to just simmer away, reduce a little bit to thicken up, then right towards the end, we'll add a knob of butter just to thicken it slightly, and then ready for the steak. A little check to the seasoning. Pinch more salt. A little bit more pepper. Sauce done. Let's have a look at this beauty. My word, that looks amazing. I know it says for two. I reckon I can manage this just me. Beautiful. And now all that needs now is resting. There's no point. If you cut into that now, it would just bleed everywhere. It'd be tough as old boots. It needs to rest. If we've cooked it for 14 minutes, you need to rest it for 14 minutes. Allow those juices to be reabsorbed within the meat. That's how you get tender, juicy steaks that just don't bleed everywhere. So that's pretty much done. Right, so these chips, naughty chips, they are ready. Let's pull those out. And like when I said to you, these are proper chips, goose fat chips. Fantastic. There we go, a little bit of salt on there. Well, they're hot. So I'm gonna take this steak out. Put it on the board. This here is just miso butter. So white miso paste that we've mixed with butter, a little bit of Worcester, and that will just glaze and bring a whole new level, a little bit more of umptionness. It's fantastic. Here's our board. We serve it with just a little bit of lamb's lettuce, like so. We get our beautiful sauce, and all we're going to do to that sauce is just monte a bit of butter into it. Monte au beurre, but you must take it off the heat. Off the heat. That's it, the butter's been incorporated into this amazing sauce and actually glossing it and thicken it. So that is the sauce done. Get the chips on there as well. Ultimate chips. Right, now we're going to carve. And when we're carving, I'm going to follow the actual line of the bone, yeah? That way we're cutting always across the grain. And what we're looking for is beautiful, medium rare. Don't know if you can see that there, but that is absolute perfection. Straight onto the plate. And that is our version of steak and chips done proper. Comfy chips, green peppercorn sauce, beautiful piece of aged meat. And for two people to share, yes, it's expensive, but by God, it's good. And it is a real treat. Lucky customers.
you can't beat a local pub, can you? That's a... You Last can't beat it. Is great. You can't beat it. There you go. Right. Now, Chef Jude Kiriyama will be treating us to a Cornish seafood hot pot shortly. And there's a masters in parsnips coming your way a little bit later. But I'll see you after the break when I'll be treating Dan Walker to a dish of tuna tartar. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up shortly, Chef Jude Kiriyama will be making the most of seafood from his adopted home in Cornwall. But first, I'm joined by a man who's made headlines on the BBC Breakfast Sofa and in the commentary box and on the Strictly Come Dancing dance floor. It's Mr Dan Walker! Yay! Hello. Hello. First James. of all, hello. Good to see you. Good. We shake hands, but also this is my house, so we right. so we have okay. So we have wine at this time in the okay. morning. But is that <laughs> okay. right? Okay. Good morning, everybody. So we're gonna. I'm gonna cook you. A, well, it's not really right. cooking. I'm cooking right. you part of this, but we're gonna do um, a, a, a tuna tartare because oh. I know you love that uh, sort of Asian flavours oh, as well. Yeah. That kind of stuff. But I'm actually gonna serve it with a deep fried poppadom with lime. So it's quite an unusual combination of the two. We've got some brilliant tuna over here. But I'm gonna dice this all up. Uh, and this creates our little tartare. So we just take a, a knife and I'm going to chop this up into sort of nice, sort of fine dice as well. So, first of all, I, yes. where do you start on a career like yours? Well, you know, love of sport, because mm. obviously we know that, that, I mean, that runs through, runs through your veins. Yes. Does that come from your family, that love of sport? Yeah, I think so. Um, my mum uh, played tennis to quite a decent standard, and my, my dad's always been, you know, a real sort of sport lover. Most of our Saturdays were watching Grandstand and. He loved football and rugby, cricket, all that right. sort of stuff. So I think you just you learn that off your parents, don't you? And and what about you as a, a sportsman? Was it was because because incredible sportsman? Fo James. <laughs> football was your thing, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, I I think because I was I'm, I'm six foot six and I was really tall when I was quite young. So I think um, maybe as as many people are that age, I had you know trials with a few teams, but also. Because I was much taller than everyone else, I, I suppose I convinced myself <laughs> I was quite good at football. Right. And then when everyone grew up to be the same height as me, I, I realised I was distinctly average. So time to move on to something else in my life. <laughs> but it was it was journalism and, and particularly radio. Radio where you first started, didn't it? You did yeah. journal, journalism at uni, but... Yeah, I started off in um, Sheffield at Hallam FM and then I went to Manchester and worked for Piccadilly Radio and covered... Manchester United travel around the world with them covering the Champions League. So it, my first season with them was in 1999 when they won the treble. For any yeah. any football fans out there, so yeah, and I, I just I love I love the drama of sport. I love the sort of natural um, build up and the the emotions that are wrapped up with it, and that, that's something that has always excited me. So right, look, we've got in here. We've got we've got our little yeah. tuna over here diced. Oh. Uh, this this goes with a combination of tuna and it goes with this is salmon roe. Okay. So like you have caviar, this is a lot cheaper alternative. Right. Oh, so <laughs> it's not because it's, I'm doing it because it's cheaper, but it's a, it is a lot lot cheaper than than Can the I alternative. Ask you a foodie question. Yes. With that, in terms of like fishy taste. Yes. Are they are they contrasting each other there or are they working what? together? Working together. Supposedly. Okay. Right. Supposedly. This is this is a work in progress. This dish. This is a rest. <laughs> this is a restaurant menu dish that's going to go on in March. That I'm testing on him. That's <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be the guinea pig. Exactly. James. So we got. So we got in here. This is a little bit of my mayonnaise. So so I, I make mayonnaise quite a bit on the show, but we just got a little. This one's slightly different. So we 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 use mustard and we use eggs. Mm. I blend it, but rather than use vegetable oil, what I've done in here is I've blended vegetable oil with herbs, and we produce this green oil. Oh, wow! So this is a this is a herb oil. So all it is is just blended. If you've got any herbs left over, right? Uh, parsley, dill, any any herbs left over, rather than throw them away or chuck them on the compost heap, you blend them with vegetable oil, mm -hmm. and then just leave them in the fridge, just hanging over a cloth overnight and it produces this amazing oil. You can freeze this as well, so you don't waste any of it. And when you make a mayonnaise out of it, it produces this amazing colour. So you just blend it up like that. Like this. Now, I can see you looking with enthusiasm. If you want to do... When you go back home, you can you can blind people with science with this. <laughs> it's a, that you looks can, impressive. Yeah, well, you, the, but I'm concerned, though. You said you're testing this out. So, essentially, if we don't see this in one of your restaurants, it's we know not very this good. has gone badly. If right. you never see this is again, it's not very good. But but this is all you're going to get to eat, to be honest with you. But this is how dishes are developed, you see. Most chefs say, oh, well, I walked around the Himalayas and, you know, a light was shining on me and I've entered this dish. What a load of rubbish. It's, they're usually drunk in a bar. They've seen something uh, and, had, and had something to eat. But, and this, is, this, is, this, this wasn't like that, by the way. I went to this restaurant in Turkey. Right. Uh, and this is, this is one of the dishes that I had. 
Um, and it was a kind of a variant of this, and then I'm sort of tweaking it as we go. But that's that. It's not about this dish anyway, it's about you. But yeah, you're, I'm I mean, you're, about you're, there's so many things you've done in your career as well. But I get the feeling the journalism side of it, the writing side of it is so important to you. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I mean, I, if, the way I look at it, James, is the only thing you know, God has given me is, is words. And I can you know, speak them on a TV show like this, I can talk about them on the radio, or I can write them down in a book. One of the reasons why I, I write about other people and I, I, I enjoy telling other people's stories is I've, I see the job as... You can be a, a sword for people who can't fight and you can be a shield for people who can't defend themselves and you can seek the I truth. Like and you can actually... You, know, you can change the world for people and I think that's an incredible privilege to be in that it's position. It's a powerful thing, isn't it? It's a responsibility as well, but that, that's why I love... You know, my job essentially is to say, look at this person they've had a really tough time or look what they're going through, but they've come out the other side and we can all learn something from what they've been through and that's that's the sort of stories I love to tell. Well, I've seen recently on, on the bits and pieces you've done on the, on the box as well, but we're talking about books. This this is this is the latest one. This is book four, this yes, one. Yes, I wrote two football books yep, and, then, and then two proper books. Over my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't, don't care about but, that at but all. No, <laughs> but this, the, the fascinating thing about this, I was flicking through this last night, you're talking about the power of the pen and everything, but the power of everyday people. Mm. This this book makes you think in terms of well, tell, explain yeah. what it's all about because you it's a speak, fascinating subject. You speak to a lot of people, don't you, in in your role? And I think for me, everybody in there is the sort of person for whom five minutes isn't enough on TV or on radio. And I want to go back to them because they've been through something that I would love to know more about how they've struggled with some big issues like you know. Rehabilitation, forgiveness, sacrifice. There's a guy called Martin Hibbert who uh, was the closest to the Manchester Arena bomb, but he survived. He was only here to, you know, three metres away from the bomber when he blew himself up. And he and his this daughter... This is the gentleman who lost his, lost his legs. Yes, he, well, he, he's, lost a, he's now in a wheelchair, lost the use of his legs. Yeah. And what I find fascinating about people like Martin is is Martin now is going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, but he refuses to be defined by it. And when you speak to him, spend any time with him, and he'll say, I'm not disabled because of my injuries, I'm disabled because of people's attitudes towards me, the fact that I'm in a wheelchair and the way they look at me and the way they think I can act. And he says that there's some days, because of what he's been through and the, the horrors that he saw, there's some days where he'll, you know, he'll sit in the shower and he'll just... he'll cry, and he finds life hard. And he says, every day... I have to get out of bed because if I stay in bed, the terrorist wins. And I can't allow that to happen. And he says, every day I climb a mountain. So that's why he said, I might as well climb a mountain. And now, earlier last year, he became only the second paraplegic ever to get to the top of Kilimanjaro in a wheelchair. I mean... It... When, you, when, you, when you're doing Incredible. research like this, I mean, as journalists, you, 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 you have to go meet these people. Yeah. You've got to go meet these yeah. people face to face. Mm. I mean, it must have been life-changing for you as well, listening it, to these, I mean... It is, yeah. It, it changes the way that you look at them, it changes the way you look at other people, and it also has an impact on how you think yourself as well, I think. And... Well, I, I was... I was reading yeah. a bit... There's, 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 the, 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 the mothers that... Oh, at the end, yeah. I mean, that... The truth about... There's a chapter in there called The Truth About Monsters, which I is... I mean, this is... This is yeah. uh, explain this, but this is, this is incredible. It's, it's, so it's, it's three women who've all had somebody in their life taken away from them, murdered, and they've all somehow found a way to forgive those people. So one of them is uh, Fegan Murray, whose son Martin Hett was killed in the Manchester Arena bomb. And then you've got Mina Smallman, whose two daughters were killed in a park in London, and she's forgiven the guy who did that. And if you speak to her, she says... You know, she's a, she's a Christian, she says that God gave me that power to forgive that man for what he did, because I can't live with that anger, I can't have that eating away at me for the rest of my life. And then the other person in that chapter is... I, know, it's, it's I, I was amazing. reading it, it's just... It, every story is yeah. just... Yeah. And Tamar's dad was killed. Tamar Pollard's dad was killed in Hungary while he was delivering humanitarian aid. And they tried to kill her mum at the same time. And then 72 hours after that <coughs> happened, her mum was live on TV and she said on television, I forgive the man who's done this to my husband uh, and I want him to know that forgiveness. And she went back to Hungary a few months after that to his court, <coughs> to this guy's court case, an 18-year-old who'd killed her husband, and she stood up in the court and she said, I want you to know that I've forgiven you for what you've done and I want your life to change because of it. 
And I just think, how can you, how can you be in that headspace? Right. It's amazing to meet these people oh, as well. Yeah, they're, inspi so, they're incredibly inspiring. It is. I don't know why we got from that to this, but, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I've done my little tuna thing. I've just mixed that together with this dressing I've mixed together with soy, mm. a little bit of yuzu. I talk about this a lot on the show. This is this yuzu juice. This is actually fresh yuzu. Um, this is what yuzu looks like. You don't ever really see that. It looks like a... Lemon. Yeah, but it's, it's actually fresh yuzu. And then the dressing of it, oh. we're going to take this... And this is the piped little... colour on that, James. Well, that's what I mean. It's a little bit of mayonnaise, but a little bit of green stuff. So I don't think this is bad as a test dish so far. I think, I think we're, we're nearly on the menu yet. <laughs> and then we're going to take some spring onion, just as a little bit of... Because I think you just need a little bit of texture in here. But you just take a nice little bit, really thin bits of string, spring onion on there. And then I've got two different types of cresses. I've got this. This, this is little baby coriander. Um, we just put a few leaves on here. And then this other stuff you can grow in the garden. Or you can grow at home on a windowsill. This is red amaranth. OK. And yeah, what's... You grow this in tissue paper. Um, and chefs are actually raving about this sort of stuff. It's like a How little How do you herb. learn all this stuff? Do you know, you said earlier you, you went to that restaurant in Turkey. If you see something amazing in another person's restaurant, do you just... Do you you sort nick of, it. You nick you, the idea. Would you, you go and have a chat with them and say... No, you just nick the idea. Oh. You <laughs> <laughs> it's not rocket science. It's I'm like having a... that. <laughs> but it's one of those things, yeah, you just... You, you, the, the, the thing about this job is that it's... It, it, people think it's competitive. It's not at all competitive. Right, you're sharing ideas. You're sharing time. ideas and everybody's... And particularly at this climate, everybody just it, wants to just keep going. And mm. So this is a little bit the same oil. We take a little bit the same oil and I'm going to put that around the edge. Oh. So this is, this is the same oil that I've used for the dressing. That goes around there. But there you have it, and you have it, and you serve it with a poppadom on the side. Mm -hmm. And there you have it, a dish that may or not, may or may not be <laughs> on my restaurant menu by March until Dan tastes it and tell me what she re really thinks of it. But uh, a salmon a salmon caviar and tuna tartare. Done. Right, bon appetit. Oh, there you go. This is a big moment. I've done it's quite a lot of TV. You're my guinea pig. But I've never tasted something that a professional chef has cooked. So I've always really? wanted, I've always wanted to do this. Really? Okay, here we well, go. Well, this is this is a test dish. So this is this is how it starts very, very early on in its sort of test kitchen-y. Right, I'm ready for thing, this. But I think we're quite go. close with that. Oh, that <laughs> I watching how much love you poured into that, I thought it would taste good, but it yeah. actually tastes. About ten times better than that. It's it nice, is. though, isn't it? That mayonnaise is mayonnaise. It's just all the, it's the combinations, isn't it? Where's the, the particularly the dressing? The dressing is the key with the soy and the yuzu and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really pungent. If you just use, you know, these these ingredients, the soy and the yuzu juice, they, they just create this amazing flavour. Those and lime, is just amazing. Because it, I'll try and describe it. Makes There's your a, mouth dance. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a beautiful softness to it. Yeah. There's a lovely crunch as well, but it's the it's the bang that you get from yeah, that stuff. It's, it's oh, James. Thing. There you go. Get it on the menu. Yeah, it's on the menu. <laughs> Done. There you go. There'll be more from Dan later on this morning. I'll be treating him to a toffee knickerbocker glory at the end of the show. You've got Come to on. see that one. <laughs> but join me again after the break where Jude Kiriyama will be making a stunning seafood hot pot. I'll see you in a bit. Oh, that really is good. Welcome back. Now we've got a masterclass in parsnips uh, on your way, and I'll be chatting some more with presenter Dan Walker in a little while this morning. But first, I'm joined in the house by Chef Mark Birchall. Um, we're getting ready to enjoy a dish from a New Zealand lad who's moved to Cornwall to represent his hometown on the great British menu. It's Juki Rama! Good to see you, Abby, on the show. Thank what, you very now, much. Now, I would say explain these ingredients, but we haven't got time. <laughs> What are we going to do with all this, then? So we're going to harvest the sea, really. So what I want to do is really like a, a Cornish hot pot. So it's all about uh, making a bisque. And a good thing about making anything like a, a shellfish uh, or crustacean sauce is it's all about these things here. Yeah. It? This is langoustines. But if, if you're at home and you have some prawns, 
prawn shells, peel those prawn shells, put them in the freezers, save it until you get a nice pile of stuff. Great, it's a great flavour. Yeah, and it has a fantastic flavour. Right, so what are we doing with these first of all? Because I know you want to get on the sauce one. I do. I, I'm, I'm going to chop this veg. Is that, oh, is that my job? Or you, that job? Oh, you can dice these ones, please. Okay, That'd be I'll fantastic. Well, you crack on and do that then. So, what we've got here is uh, all the ingredients for our um, hot pot. So, we're going to make a first sock, which is the langoustine stock. And now I'm going to make the hot pot. Because you're doing a fantastic job over there. You're really good at this. Well, to, to get in there. <laughs> so, in here, I'm just going to put a little dash of oil. Bit of practice over the years. Uh, While well, you're doing a wonderful job, thank you very much. And, and with that, can I give you a hand with that fennel? There you go. I'll let you all get that. Oh, yeah. Here we go. So, we're in with the celery, in with the carrots. There you go. Fantastic. Bit of fennel. And that goes. And it's, uh, you know, it's this is about adding a, a double stock to this. It's about adding extra flavour into this. Thank you. So okay. tell us about the restaurant then. What 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 brought you over from New Zealand to, to start off with? Was it London London calling? What was yes, it? Yes, London was calling. Um, like, um, you see, Kiwis used to get a two-year working visa way back then. <laughs> I come here so long ago. You know, I, I came over here with a two-year working visa and I thought I was going to be here for two years and then I'd be going back to New Zealand to open my own place. But uh, my late wife was from Cornwall, so that's she... Why, that's yeah. why you went there. So I got country. dragged down to Cornwall and, and loved it. Um, while we're talking, while this yeah. is frying up, you want me to get on these? So yes, yeah. please. I'll grab a few mussels and cockles. We'll pop them in here. We just want these to just pop open. Inside here, inside the, uh, it's just not water that we're steaming it in. We've got, um, we've got some uh, a hondashi stock powder. Right. We've got some onions and uh, sorry, shallots and garlic. Again, we've got some uh, bay leaf and thyme in there, and that's going to steam open these. Lovely shellfish. So rather than just doing the water, the water's flavoured, so you get the... Absolutely. So you're getting a little bit more of flavour, and I'm going to use a little bit of that liquid into my emulsion. When I come back through and everything's cooked, I've got the lovely uh, sea vegetables here. Uh, this is... This might take a while, but that's OK. I've got lots of other ingredients yeah, to well, get on Exactly. To. So what are, we, what are we doing with the rest of it, then? To so, exp explain to us th this one first, because the mayonnaise bit we've got in this little bag over here. Yeah, so we've got uh, a saffron mayonnaise. And yeah. uh, so for this, um, again, saffron is really steeped in, in Cornish history. Um, so back in the day, uh, the Cornish used to, obviously, we were tin rich. Have you been to Port Ainsworth? Because he thinks everything in the world comes from Cornwall. Yeah, we, we get the same even. Oh, right, WhatsApp okay, group. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're not part of that WhatsApp That's, group, well, yeah? No, no, exactly. I've just got a feeling that everything comes... Everything was invented in Cornwall. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, exactly. Cricket so Cricket next will be invented in Cornwall. Yeah, yeah here we go. Well, we didn't call it, we call it something else. <laughs> nah, but, yeah, definitely was stolen. Uh, so, but, uh, the, the saffron mayonnaise you've got in here. Yes, yeah. so the saffron mayonnaise. So, what I normally do is just get a little bit of uh, a small pan with a little bit of rapeseed oil, uh, crush the garlic, cook it very gently with the saffron, let it cool down, and then make a mayonnaise. With, the, with that mayonnaise, I'd blitz um, uh, it's just the egg yolk, yeah. uh, white wine vinegar, a bit of Dijon mustard. Right. Uh, and then I'll season it with a little bit of Cornish sea salt, of course. Yeah. And uh, some cayenne pepper. And what is this? What is this you're putting in? This isn't a lot of this. What, what is this? Um, this one is a sake. Right. Uh, and you know, I think a lot of the ingredients that I use are steeped in, you know, the sakes and everything else. So in here, in fact, the sort of. It's Cornish. <laughs> yeah, you, well, you, you're, uh, you're, you're getting the same way as me. You well, see. Well, you know, we could have used a, some Cornish pastis in here as well. But anyway, so we've got some sake in here and. Uh, actually, we'll put the pastis as well. Thank right. you. Right. So what we normally do is that we will um, put this on the boil and then we'll flame this. All I need is a bit of a lighter. How are we going there? Yeah, lighter. These look beautiful. I've got a lighter. Oh, yeah, you do. Oh, thank you very yeah. much. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only piece of equipment you haven't used today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is all going to, you know, you'll wait for the flames to come down, you've burnt off all the alcohol from there. Um, and then from there, we start adding, once this burns down, we've got the langoustine stock and the fish stock. Right. Oh. So I'm going to... That pasty has got a lot of alcohol, hasn't it? Yeah, so I'm going to pick out the pick out the meat out of these shells while you, Thank can, you. you can crack on and do that. So... so it's really about the sauce, isn't it? Everything's about that sauce. We've got some fantastic seafood, but we need to marry it up. Uh, so here we go, that's all cooked off. So now we're going to add 
the fish stock. Right, so tell us about these then, because these, these are what's going in next thing. Yeah, they are. So, this, this, we've all used these on the show, oh, but you yeah. can tell us a bit, this particularly about it, because I got told off for pronouncing it wrong. Got you, Jang. Um, wonderful thing. I think people, I mean, it's just one of those ingredients that wasn't around probably, what, 10 years ago? If so. Yeah, and uh, people are putting it everywhere. Mayonnaise, you're putting them in stock sauces. Yeah. I'm adding it in here because I love that extra layer of spiciness. Um, what, what, you know... Is it f fermented chilli in, in it? That's, it that's is, what it is. Absolutely. It's quite strong stuff, though, isn't it? It is. It is. So you've got to be really careful. I mean, people utilise all these ingredients, but sometimes they're not sure how to season with it. This is quite powerful stuff, and also it can be quite sweet, so you only want a little bit. So I've got in here... Quarter of a teaspoon in here. Yeah. But also, together with this, it's good. This adds such a oomph for me. I think miso is something that I've used for, for many years. It's something that I didn't quite grow up with it, but it is one of these yeah. things. Uh, my mum's Chinese Malay, and so we've always used lots of, you know, fermented different ingredients uh, from Asia. And, uh, and Malaysian sea, uh, cuisine is so, you know, uh, it's mixed. They've got such a huge influence. Do you know Malaysia yeah. very well? Or? Not at all. <laughs> well, <they've> got, <laughs> yeah, but they've got, you know, lots of um, uh, influence from the local Malaysians, the, uh, the indigenous people. Then you've got the Chinese that move there. And then you've got huge Indian uh, ingredients there. Um, so I've just added some of the uh, miso paste into there. Right, so next. So I'll get the fish on for you. And Thank then you. Can you. Tell us, tell us we've got so the sea bass we're just going to put in. Pan fry this. Oh, look at that. That's lovely. So in here, I do need a little bit of strain, but I'm going to strain off some of this stock here. So that's got some of the muscle juices in it. Yeah, it? it has. So muscle juice, sake, thyme. Right, bit of salt, bit of pepper. Thank you. So here, we would have strained this off and seasoned it, and here we have the sauce. Yeah. Oh, that's intense. <laughs> it's strange, isn't it, when you reduce things? It gets more flavoursome. There you go. What have we got? Fish, is, fish is about 30 seconds away. Wow. Well, and that's great. Right. You've got those mushrooms there. Yeah, he's good, isn't he? Yeah, fish, fish is about 30 oh, seconds away. Oh. I'm waiting for you, Chief. Some lemon. Oh, 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 oh. In that case, <laughs> I've got this. Here we go. We've got two plates. We've got a jug. Now, I'm going to start just warming up these sea vegetables, these lovely shellfish. But when I came to your restaurant, you, had the beautiful, you have these beautiful bowls and it's packed full of flavour. You're doing the similar oh. sort of thing that we've got in here. Well, in here, this is kind of like... I thought this is something that's more budget. I mean, I know we've got sea bass, but that was all we had. This dish can be done with any piece of fish, really. Um, as humble or as... Expensive you like, but the main thing is that these things can be foraged. Mussels can be picked on the on the river. Uh, cockles, the same thing. You can forage your cockles. All the seaweed is normally foraged from our from our restaurant. And um, yeah, for me, it, it's you know it's quite a humble dish, although it's it's been elevated, but it's very humble ingredients, I think. So yeah, it's um. I say it, they, um, they do fresh mussels and cockles. Oh, I can't yeah, so 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 good. Then here, we can put this little sauce in the jug so that I won't kill Mark, cos he's been really kind of... I can't. <laughs> he was so embarrassed today, he says, I'm really sorry. I've heard what you're cooking. Um, you know, you could kill me, you didn't say that. Is it, said, is, it the, is, is it the mussels or what is it? No, it's crustacean stock, but mm. oddly I can eat crustacean. It's just the intensity of the sauce, but... It's, it's very mild. It's very so mild. It's Don't muscles. worry. Don't panic. So that you're okay with? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. But not that. Yeah. So here we go. Really simply, a few of these. Very humble dish. Thank very you. humble dish. You just need 16 people to wash yeah, up after you. Yeah, you know, <laughs> love, love costs. You know, this is this is what happens. You know, you got to. It's a sacrifice. I'm going to be fed well, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So and help. Feed the mushrooms through there. I love the richness of those mushrooms as well. I 
And then, for us, let's have a little taste of this sauce. Oh, that's rich. Delicious, sorry. It is very rich. This is for you, Mark. See, so I didn't kill you. <laughs> I appreciate it. So if you put one on one... One in here. Yeah, one on one, and we'll leave the other one plain. But... So while you're doing that, then, give us the name of this dish, then. It's a Cornish hot pot with Cornish seafood um, and sea vegetables. How good does that look? One without. Thank you very much. One with ish mm. sauce. But you've got everything else. Yeah. Dive into it. Tell me what you think. Look at this. Well, it's going to be, like I say, poor, poor Mark and his uh, lack of. Uh, I think I'm, I'm doing all right with this, sir. All right. Yeah, yeah I said the sauce is the. That's no, beautiful. Yeah, it's delicious. Lovely. It really is. That is a brilliant dish. Jude, everybody. Top. Yeah. Uh, right, you're going to be sticking around for the rest of the day. Yeah, good, good, absolutely. Good, good. And I was showing you how to use the best of seasonal parsnips in this week's masterclass. Three dishes I'm going to be making as well. Uh, and I'll be making an epic knickerbocker glory for my guest, Dan Walker, a little bit later. But join me again after the break when Jude, Mark and me will be trying to answer some of your culinary questions for the new year. I'll see you in a bit. This is lovely. Welcome back. Now I'll be giving you a masterclass in parsnips very surely. We've got more fantastic food on the way from Mr Mark Birchall in just a bit. But first, as always, uh, we'd like to help you out by answering some of your questions on food and cooking on the show. Uh, but we've all been a bit busy over Christmas and everything, so today we thought Mark, Jude and I would uh, dive into the mailbag, and the mailbag is pretty full, and tackle some of your kitchen dilemmas. I've got loads of them over here, guys. So this is kind of like a, a question time for chefs. Really? <laughs> you don't get judged on your answers, yeah, these, these sort of stuff. So first of all, we've got Mary Brown. Uh, what is the best kitchen gadget you couldn't live without? Oh, mm. I've got a microplane, I think. The microplane's yeah. pretty amazing. It's something that uh, you can grate down things from ginger to garlic, to zest. Um, yeah, I love a microplane. Yeah. Yes. That's a good one. Huh? Mine's, mine's I, a... I was going to say that. <laughs> you were going to say that. <laughs> Are you a uh, tweezer man? Not at home. Not, not at, at home, home but um, in the kitchen. Yeah. What could you live without in the kitchen? What... Probably a, a spice grinder. Yeah? Yeah. Mm. So if you're making you know, something with loads of aromats, yeah. you know, toast them off, quick whiz up. Sure. Mine would mine would yeah. definitely be my chopping board. I think wooden chopping boards. Yeah. So, there's something nice about proper proper wood, yeah. and and the, you, the, yeah. the, you, rather than the plastic chopping boards. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, them glass ones. Yeah, the glass mm, ones. Are, they're ruining your knives as oh. well, really. So please wooden, don't buy those. Yeah, wooden <laughs> chopping boards. There you go. So th there you go, Mary. That, that's that's one of the questions done. Um, right. How do you make good stock out of bones? So let's start up. There's different ones. So first of all, fish stock. You want to cook for no more than about twenty minutes. So yep. you put mm. so you put white vegetables in there. So uh, white of the leek, celery, onion, bit of bay leaf, bit of peppercorns. Boil it up with cold water. Cook it for about sort of twenty minutes, and then drain it off. That's your fish stock. Chicken stock. Do you roast the carcasses off beforehand? Or... Yeah, I mean, if we're doing a white stock, I actually steam right. them just to kind of blanch them. Brown, yeah, we just gently roast, but don't over roast. If you over roast, it becomes quite bitter. Yeah. Same with the vegetables, don't over roast them. You just get too much of a bitterness. There you go, but it does take time. You need a big yeah. pot. Yeah. There you go. Uh, right. How do you get that charcoal flavour when cooking indoors? Wow. Use <laughs> a yakitori grill. Yeah, well, yeah. It, no, the most. Grill. But the most yeah, important yeah. bit is these grills that you see me use quite a lot, but it's the charcoal's the important bit. It's this. Yeah. It's, that it's got to be the the good quality, the, the good best quality. charcoal, yeah. really. Japanese bichitan. That's uh, the one. Charcoal and uh, and those new Conroy grills. Uh, they come in lots of sizes. They can be bigger or smaller, and yeah. they're so safe indoors. Yeah. And, they're, and they're heat proof. So yeah. great things. But particularly the Japanese charcoal. That's the key to it, really. That's if you are going to do it inside, make sure it's well ventilated, but use that charcoal. Mm. Absolutely. Because that's that's what holds it. The other way to do it is to get a, a, a cast iron griddle pan. Now, you're not going to get a similar sort of flavour, 
but cast iron griddle pan, the key to that really is get the griddle pan nice, very, very hot before you even start. It needs to be smoking before you start, and I always oil the food rather than the griddle. And you sit it on there and leave it, and that gives it the charring marks. That will give you that sort of flavour, but really, really hot it needs to be. But always oil, if you're doing a steak, always oil the steak, not the griddle, and, and sear it like that. Get and I always find seasoning it off afterwards. Guy. Yeah, you can do a little chefy chip. There's a there's a guy called Wolfgang Puck who's in in America. He puts a little bit of stock cube, beef stock cube, on halfway through the cooking over the top of beef, which is a nice little bit of umami sort of flavour. There's mm. smokiness to it, but there you have it. That's that one. Uh, so, what's the best way to sharpen the knives, and how do you determine uh, a sharpening angle? Um, I'm going to show you this really. So I would. So you've taken your average steel, which looks like that. I always think when your knife goes on it, your your finger can go sort of that degree. It should be sort of I think it's 33 degrees, something yep. like that. That's what you're looking at. But if you put your finger... So imagine that's a steel. Put your finger on the steel and put your knife on it. This is the knife. And that's where the blade should sit, I think. Um, the alternative thing is go on Google and find somebody who'll come round and <laughs> chat and garden <laughs> do it for you. They're amazing, yeah. aren't they? You must yeah. get them in the kitchen, don't you? Oh, you get the people who come round and chat me nice. They try to, but I've got my own stones, so I've got my own wet stones. Um, so it depends. I've got a, a thousand grip, which is quite uh, rough, and then I bring it down to a 4,000 grit, uh, very smooth, uh, a smoother stone, and then after that I use a steel. So, you so know, these, scrap steel, ones, otherwise in between. If you are going to use a stone, they're amazing, but it takes yeah. time for people to understand what... It does what take time, yeah, chuck yeah. them in the shop, you'll the, be fine. Yeah, practice is, the, practice is the thing with that, really. If you're going to buy, you can buy the packs of stones, really, you start with the rough grade and you work your way yeah. down. It's... I would yeah. say as well, if you're using a steel, put a cloth on the table, put it vertical and just mm. run the knife down it. Yeah, so you do that 30, yeah. 60, yeah, was going to say 30, nice and slow. There you go. Right, yeah. here's another one that's good for... Uh, how do you preserve uh, herbs to prevent them from... Well, to stop you from throwing them away? Oils, freezing, etc. So you've got a lot of bits of herbs left over, which people do have in the bottom of their cupboard. Yeah. Mine would be oil. I just think mine would be vegetable oil. You just blend them with a little bit of salt, vegetable oil, but blend them a decent amount of time. You've got to yeah. blend it. I yeah. put plenty of oil in there and just leave it in the fridge overnight, just sat over a cloth. And you've got this amazing green oil. Yeah, Absolutely. let it drip out or you know, going back to the salt, you know, blend, blend, get some coarse sea salt, blend the herbs into that, then when you, you know, do some cooking or you want to salt some whatever duck legs mm. or something or a Vinegars. lamb shoulder, yeah, exactly. There you go. Well we've got we've got we're just we're just we we'll we'll just, just do one more. We've got time for one more. There you go. This is a good one. What is your ultimate meal from Linda? Fish and chips, Linda. Fish and chips. Fish and chips. Your go-to, you must have something. You go back and you go, you must have something like, it, it's either sour cream on a boiled egg or... or, or <sighs> it's got to be, it's, it's got my go-to meal is roast chicken. Star. No. Roast chicken, um, I think. Roast chicken? Yeah, you can't beat roast chicken, can you? But nice Thai curry, nice red, red mm. Thai curry. Red Thai curry. Yeah. Roast chicken and fish and chips. It says a lot about us lot, doesn't it, really? There you go. <laughs> uh, right, Mark will be cooking for us shortly and we'll be serving up a toffee knickerbocker glory at the end of the show for Dan Walker. But after the break, I'll be giving you a little masterclass in parsnips. Parsnips three ways. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be fixing up Dan Walker with a second course shortly and the award-winning chef Mark Birch will be showcasing his amazing skills in the kitchen. That's coming up next. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass. And this week, it's all about the humble little parsnip. I love this sort of stuff. Uh, and way back in ye olde times, they used to use these as pig feed. And I don't understand why, because nobody used to eat them. They're amazing sort of things, these things. Um, and so versatile as well. We're going to do three dishes with it. Soup, do roasted parsnips. Um, I'm going to do parsnip crisps, really simple. But show you how to do all of them, first of all. So roasted parsnips, first of all. Now, because the parsnips are so good, you don't need to peel them for roasted parsnips. So what you want to do is just chop them up into pieces. And you want to make sure, most importantly, that all are sort of even size pieces, because you want them to all cook together. So you take the large parsnip like that, and I actually like, a bit like doing roasted carrots, I actually like the peel on it rather than peel them. It's up to you, you can peel it off if you want. I leave the root in it, the whole lot. Because I'm a farmer's kid and we don't like to waste anything, I think, more, more importantly. But we just chop this all up and we'll get a pan on the stove. Because this, this is done quite quickly. There's several ways of doing this. And when I ask the team, the foodie team, uh, one of them, they, they blanch the parsnips beforehand and then roast them off. But this is a much quicker and, much, I think, much more easier way of doing it, really. But it uses an ingredient that I absolutely love with parsnips, and that's sherry at the end. 
and I'll show you that in a second. So we've got the raw parsnips like that. Again, because you've got the, the skin on, it gives you a lovely texture as well. So in the pan now, we can add some butter and we can add water. This is the key to it. Water and butter. You get this emulsification first. That goes in there. Add the parsnips. They go in. So you're sort of bringing these to the boil at the same time, like that. They can go in. We add salt and pepper. So you can be quite rustic with it. It's not too formal. So black pepper, nice little bit of salt. And then grab some fresh thyme. So we can chop up some fresh thyme. You can use dry thyme if you want. You can use a little bit of rosemary. It's internally up to you. But it does need a little bit of thyme. Can go in there as well. So we'll pop that over the top. And then some honey. Just some runny, runny honey is what you want. Over the top. Now, it looks nothing now, but trust me, when it comes out of the oven and we finish this off the way I'm going to finish it off, it'll taste amazing. So, once you get to that stage, because the steam and everything is in there, it's cooking your pasta, it's, we take the whole lot straight in the oven. Straight in there. That's going to be, like, left to roast. Now, at the same time of this, we can get on our soup, we can get our parsnip crisps. So, our parsnip crisps comes to the form as we peel the parsnips for this one. So, for the soup, you want to peel them, really. But we're not going to waste anything, because this that I'm peeling is your parsnip crisps. So once we get to this stage, that's it. We'll keep going. And we only want just a couple of parsnips for the soup, just to show you. But it's relatively straightforward. So peel, like that. And then in the pan now, I'm going to put some milk. Now, I use full-fat milk for this. I purely fact that I don't like semi-skimmed. <laughs> and then I'm going to take keep this remainder stuff and then trim that off because we don't want that. Trim that off because we don't want that. And then with these, because we want the nice colour with this, that's why we just peel them nicely. But once you've got that. But then the key to this really is chop these nice and thin. Because with soup, people often think, oh, it's just a load of vegetables in a pan. You just boil it to death. What soup is and what soup should be is just cooked vegetables. And you don't want to overcook them. If you overcook them, it's just going to taste of overcooked veg. So just cook them exactly as you do if you were serving them for sort of a Sunday lunch. That kind of stuff. And we want to take the parsnips there, nice and thinly sliced. So we just bring that to the boil. Make sure you bring that to the boil. At the same time now, we can add a little bit of this. This is a little bit of mild curry powder. It's purely optional, if you want, but just a touch of mild curry powder, as we want in there. And this, particularly this time of year, this makes this soup a lovely winter warmer, which is what we want. So we just bring, bring that to the boil, like that, and just basically cook those. Now, at the same time as that, keep your eye on it, because obviously the milk will boil over. So just make sure we, we just get that up to a boil and just gently, gently simmer that. It's going to take no more than about sort of five minutes. Now, at the same time as that, we can turn our attention to other parsnips we've got in here. Now, we can then do our crisps. Now, the thing about this is you've got the peel, but also if you just want to use and do crisps, you can then just keep going. So, as I said, just keep going into strips like this and take the whole parsnip right the way down. Now, when you're frying this, it's a bit different to sort of potato crisps because these vegetables, like carrots, like parsnips, have quite a bit of moisture in it. And when you're frying them, you want to drop the temperature of the fryer down. The thing about this is you don't want it too hot. If it's too hot, the parsnips, what happens is they brown and they look good, but when you take them out, they go soggy. So what you want to do is drop the temperature down and you want to get rid of that moisture from the parsnips by slowly cooking them. Now, you've got to do this in two batches, so it's no good doing it all in one. So you want to do this in two batches. So what we're going to do is just take this. This is just going to go straight in the fryer first, straight in, and then mix this together. Now, you can see what's happening. There's all this moisture coming off here. So we're going to roll this around so they don't all stick together, like that. And you cook these gently. And the idea is to cook them where you just colour them, but you want them crisp at the same time. They don't take very long, but they do. If the pan's too hot, they'll brown straight away and they'll go really soggy. So keep your eye on them there, like that. So once you've got the parsnips like this, you can take them out and you can see they're just nicely golden coloured. You can lift those out. 
spread them out a bit so they drain off a little bit. As soon as they come out, sprinkle it with a bit of salt. And then we can go in again. So it's important that you do these in batches, like I was saying. So straight in, straight in the fryer, and keep going. Now, the good thing about these, particularly Chris, they will actually hold. It's a bit like potato crisps. They won't go soggy. Once you make them like this and you do them in the fryer and it's the right temperature, they will hold nicely. But you can see what's happening, really, when you're doing this in the fryer, it bubbles up. And then when all this moisture's gone, and this is the moisture in here that you're seeing, once this is gone, this will just die down and they'll just cook nicely. So the important thing is that temperature of the fryer. About 160, you want to be? Something like that. You can go as low as what, sort of 150 if you want to cook them without colour. You can see as that sort of moisture starts to disappear, which is going now, the bubble starts to disappear off the fryer and it continues to cook. And then just bring these over because you can just take these and pop them into a little... But there, look. Look at that. Amazing. And if you use a combination of different vegetables as well, parsnips, carrots, beetroot, that kind of stuff, you've got a multicoloured bit of crisps in a bowl, but I think they're perfect for this time of the year. They just taste delicious. And, and as garnish for a soup, they're also brilliant. So you can see, we just roll them around. Keep moving them around in the fryer. That's the key to it. Otherwise, they'll just get a big lump of them. So move them around. If they start to firm up a little bit, then you stop. Just move them around like this. Lift them off. So once you've got a nice uh, colour on them, lift these out, drain them off. It. As soon as they're sort of drained off, nice sprinkling of salt over the top. And there you have a wonderful bowl of parsnip crisps. Look at those. They look amazing. They taste fantastic as well. So once you've got those done, we can then concentrate on our soup. The soup is really simple. Once the parsnips are cooked, which they are, you can just test it with a knife. They're cooked. They're only going to take five, five, six minutes, no more. And then into your blender. So you can use your little stick blender if you want. But it's a good idea to invest in a, in a... If you're doing this quite a lot, in a blender that really, really blends, that's what you want. And you want to blend this until it's really smooth. Now, if you want to do a puree, it's done exactly the same way. You just use less milk. So what you want to do is just stick the lid on it. Now, be careful when you're doing this with a hot liquid. Make sure you don't put the centre bit in. It creates a vacuum, explodes everywhere. You've seen me do that on TV a few times, live. <laughs> Cover this over. Make sure that your assistant has not put this on full power to stitch you up live on TV. <laughs> Sam head. We flick this on, and then we start this low, and then we can start to speed this up. Then you can add a little bit more milk or cream if needed. Now, once you've got it blended like that, take this and pop it straight into your pan. And you can see you've got this amazing, simple little, beautiful velvety soup. Really easy. Now, the great thing about this as well, it freezes nicely. If you want to alter the texture of it, a little bit more milk, like that. And like I said, if you want it thicker, just save a little bit of that milk back and then just blend it with a little bit less milk in there. But you see this gorgeous, gorgeous soup that we've got in here. Now, what I do is finish it off. I know people are going to go, yeah, of course you would. But you finish this off with butter. But the, the butter is an important part of it. It just adds a little bit of flavour to it as well. But the most important thing with soups, I think, really, is apart from the pepper, is definitely salt. The key to seasoning soup is you think you've got enough salt in it, put more in, and it will take it. It needs it. So it needs a decent amount of salt. We just mix all this lot together, and then this is ready to be served. You can freeze this as well. That's the great thing about this as well. So we just take our soup now. Look at the colour of that. We've got beautiful. This this perfect for this time of the year. That lovely little sort of yellow tinge from it comes from that. Just a touch of curry powder in there. And then we can finish this off. 
I've just got a little bit of cream, just some double cream that I put in there as well. Just a little smidgen of that. It's a little chefy drizzle. This is a little bit of green oil that I have in the fridge. Just a bit of fun. You've got a little bit of olive oil. Touch of that. Sprinkling that. Like a Jackson Pollock, doesn't it? Look. And then you just take your little parsnip crisps and you just dot of these on there. Instead of sort of using bits of bread, but I think this just has a nice little texture to it as well. But there you have it, a wonderful little soup, little parsnip crisps, but don't forget, in the oven, just to finish this off, we've got the roasted parsnips. So these come out, having been in the oven like that. Look, very, very quick, very, very simple. And then all we do now is fire up the stove. This is the key to it. So fire up the hob now, get this nice and hot. Now, what you want to do now is boil this rapidly and you want to get rid of that moisture. That moisture is your friend in the oven, which is cooking the parsnips, but it's your enemy when it comes to this. So what we want to do is just increase the idea of this little glaze with a touch more honey. And it, the, the, once this sort of liquid evaporates off, you get this combination, this glaze of butter and honey and a little bit of the water that's left over. And then this is when we reach for our sherry. Now, this, this revolutionises roast parsnips. It really does. So you've got a lovely little caramel happening over here, which you can see from the honey as it starts to colour everything. I can see that happening there. Then right at the last minute, just a little drizzle. You want to do it too much, just a little drizzle of sherry over the top. And then as this starts to come together, we can then sort it all this lot together, a nice little bit of colour. Get your plate ready. And it's ready to serve. And you've got your beautiful roast parsnips, like that. Look at the colour of that and the glaze and everything else, stickiness. There you have it. So there you have it. Three dishes out of the humble little parsnip. You've got roasted parsnips with sherry. That is a game changer. Nice little bit of parsnip soup. And then, of course, don't forget your parsnip crisp. Done. Easy as that. Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about, a little master class, then do get in touch. We'll see if you're going to help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes with an incredibly talented chef, Mr Mark Birch, who will be wowing us with a lovely winter dish of his very own. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now I'll be treating my guest, Dan Walker, to a banana knickerbocker glory and a banana split very shortly. But first, he's the holder of two Michelin stars, a Michelin green star, five AA rosettes. His restaurant, Mohall, was crowned best restaurant in England, second best in the UK. Life's not too bad for this gentleman at the moment. It's the brilliant Mark Birchall. <laughs> you joining us as well? You have to be joining us for this, don't you? Oh, yeah. I'd exactly. Love to. <laughs> so, first of all, congratulations. Another year. Another Thank spectacular you. year. Thank you. Yeah, oh, it's incredible. In absolutely incredible. So, we're going to talk about that and what you're doing at the moment and the new stuff that's happening at the moment. So, tell us, tell us about what you're going to be cooking then, because this is, we don't think we've ever had this on the show. Uh, so, we've got some venison, some deer. Um, yeah. From, it's a seeker variety, so it's a nice seeker hind from the Isle of Purbeck. And it's just beautiful. Well, I'll let you butcher uh, that, because I know you want to butcher that first of all, yeah, so, so off you go. We've got the short line here, so the yep. saddle. We're just going to take that for I'm going to switch the pan on for you, so you've got, got that ready. Jesus. So away you go. You can tell us. So I'm just going to go into the spine bone, uh, straight down, so you, you kind of can't go any further. Now, Mohol, when you, when you first went there, you actually didn't like the building, did you? That's, is that true? Yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, it just felt a little dark, obviously. I mean, it's a 16th century building, so... Yeah, naturally, it's not going to be the brightest uh, yeah. <laughs> building in the world. But, yeah, it just didn't feel quite right. But then the second visit we had, it just... I could visualise where we could yeah. put the restaurants and what we could do with the barn. But and... it's, it's built on and on and on. You've got the barn now and you've got the second restaurant, so yeah. you've got, you know... Yeah. It's almost like a foodie destination up there, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, we're so lucky. We're on six acres. You know, we've got a little room to make some charcuterie. We've just... Uh, launched a dairy this year. Yeah. Uh, we make our cheese. Now, I firm first came across you, was it 2009? Some of that? Was that one? Rue Scholarship? Yeah, that was probably the first, first goal, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Two, you, with 2011. Rue, yeah. Well, you, 2011, you won it, yeah, but yeah. You, you won the Rue Scholarship, which they, they steamed as like a life changing thing. And I think it is for a lot of people. Sat Baines has won it, and 
you know, you, you, you want it, it, but it leads you to go on to experience in any restaurant anywhere in the world, and you chose a particular one. Yeah, so I went to El Salo de Can Roca in yeah. Girona the, with the Roca brothers, and it was, it was amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was just a great way of life as well, like taking yourself out of your comfort zone in a, you know, a slightly different culture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was good fun. I'm just going to like take the sinew from underneath this. Right. I like to do it uh, almost like you're going to skin a fish. So I just like to go underneath and ideally it comes off in one, but yeah. it probably won't today. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it will. Um, so yeah, yeah so, you're not, so you're not wasting lots of meat. Yeah. And it's relatively clean. You might just have to trim a few little bits off that. The flavour's amazing, though, I have to say. But people try in venison for the first time. If you want to try it, there's brilliant farm stuff out there. Mm. Like, the, you know, you can get... It's not as strong as... So sort of wild venison. I often think venison can be a hit, bit hit and miss. It can be. It can be, especially, you know, when it's that kind of musky season. I mean, yeah. you know, I think venison should be cooked all year round, and it's fantastic in summertime as well. It's yeah. such a lean yeah, protein. There's, there's and, enough yeah. breeds and varieties to mm. keep you going all year round. It's, it's so good for you. So you're not actually... You're cooking it in three ways. Seal it off on here. Yeah. You could cook it in the oven, we're going to finish it off on the griddle that we've got over there. Exactly, yeah. So we're really, you know, we're really treating it well. Um, I'll move that out of the way. So you wash your hands and then you can... So we just want, just want a light seal. Trying yeah. to let it spit all over you. Like that. That's all right. And then you've got... <laughs> then we've got the bone which is in here, which you're going to cook... This is, you're going to cook it on the bone as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's just like a little trivet. So just use the rib bones just to protect it from, from the, metal, uh, the metal tray. And that should take about 20 minutes. Now, you're cooking this at 95 degrees. Yeah, 95, should 15, 20 minutes. Right. You ideally want... Looks amazing, oh. that, though. Oh, it looks beautiful. It looks so tender it's already. There, right? OK, yep. right, so once we've got that, next up, you, you got the mushrooms. I know you want to get them on, then we'll do the beetroot, so... Yeah, so... <laughs> so tell us about the mushrooms. Mushrooms, so they're hen of the woods. Um, yeah. These are a cultivated, cultivated variety. You, you can't get them wild. They don't look too dissimilar. Yeah. Um, but I've just lightly steamed them to just soften them slightly, and I'm just going to pick some nice bit fats. I'm just going to cut a couple of pieces off, just for the plate. And the hen of the woods are so... so I mean, the, the, yeah. everything that... I always think when stuff's in season, like your venison, mm. like your mushrooms are in season, everything just sort of... The cob nuts are all sort of links in together, doesn't it, really? Absolutely. Yeah. This suit looks so seasonal and beautiful. Right, then we've got the... the Tell us about the, the, the beetroot. I'll get that warmed up for you, that one. Yeah, so we just bring them to the boil, just yep. to, and then we'll let them sit in the pickle. Yeah. Got some little baby beetroots from our garden, a Pablo variety. Now, tell everybody, your, your garden... I mean, the garden is an important part of the process of Mohol, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's um, part and parcel of what we do. You know, the whole of West Lanx is notorious for growing produce, so we wanted to, wanted to emulate that, and there's an original wall garden, which just kind of, it just lends itself to yeah. growing. Right, so beetroot goes in. Yeah, beetroot. Just make yourself a little, little parcel, fold it over nice and neat. And that will take 40 minutes at 180. Thank you. 180, that's done, all right. And we've got that, and you're using that as a, as a puree that you've got in here. Yeah, so we'll... Two, so these are the two these ways. ones that I can just show you. These, these are the little beetroot that we've got in here. Two ways. We'll puree some to make this little silky puree. And I've put in here a little reduction of Madeira. Right. So just take the earthiness, the edge off the earthiness. Yeah. And a tiny bit of Cabernet Sauvignon vinegar just to spike it up a little bit. Right, so that's that. And then tell us about this dressing that we've got in here, then. So we've got some smoked bone marrow. So we've brined, brined this. So yeah. it pops out, we soaked it for a couple of days, brined it for a couple of days, and diced it up. The course you have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we um, all do that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so we, I'm just going to render it a little bit, just to soften the fat there. Uh, what about having your own place, then? Is it everything you envisaged, or...? Because, um, you know, you've got your own little gastronomic world up there. Simon Rogan's now got three stars up there. You've got your own little... Your own little gastronomic world up there. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It, you know, it's, it is amazing that you know up north. Now it's not it's not a culinary desert. There's some amazing restaurants and it's fantastic. You know, it's not it's not it's not without its uh, <laughs> tasks. Yeah, exactly. We say. Yeah. 
Um, so I've got some pickled shallot, got some dried tomatoes, and some tomato seeds. We're just making this nice, nice little dressing, just to go over the, the actual venison there. There we go. Right, so you've got our chives there. Yeah, just put a little bit of venison jus in there. Good pinch of salt. We'll put the chives in last last minute. Because we're not not far off now. So you, this is the this is the venison that's been been out and rested. Yeah, that's resting. Um, you see, it's, just, it's really gently cooked. It should be nice and pink. Should be nice and pink in there. Cool. Um, if it's all gone to plan. And then you want me to flash <laughs> that on the barrel, do you? Yeah. Okay. So we'll put um, a little bit of this. A little bit of fat on there before you do that. Give it a good roll round. Goes on there. And then we're almost ready to serve it, so this goes straight on here. So you're not actually cooking it on here, you're just sort of finishing... Just, yeah, we're just, just, just getting a little bit of smokiness. That smokiness on it. Put a little bit more of this on it to smoke it up a bit. Oh, yeah, I love the beetroot with, the, um, with that bone marrow. It'd be beautiful. I'm already salivating. Yeah, this on here, just... <laughs> Look at that. Tell me when you want it off. Yeah, we'll get that off straight away if we there can. There you go. And I'll get your plates. We're almost there with everything, so... Yeah, so we've got the venison, we've got some dressing. Got the warm food, warm plates. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Mr Brian Turner, <laughs> you're watching. <laughs> this is the bit where you've done all this work, now you've got to make it look nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not drop beetroot all over the yeah, plate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, there we go. First one sliding around. So I'm just going to pop them on there. No, no, nothing crazy. Just a nice little pile of them. And, and, and this all from a guy like myself who failed cookery at school. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I love this. Did you did no, you pass it? Cookery? Did you pass cookery at school? No, of course so not. All three no, of us. No. All three of us failed cookery um, at school. Yeah, it bodes well, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Take cookery, <laughs> fail it, and you might do okay. Yeah. What you've got there? What's that? So this is some elderberry vinegar gel, mm. just to give a really nice fruitiness on the dish. You know, I believe, I'm a big believer in, of like foods that have all the same colour generally mm. go all really well yeah. together. Um, got some of the. This is the beetroot puree. Yeah, a bit of beetroot puree. Just a couple of spoons of that. You could just put this under the beetroot if you wanted to. You could do a nice little, uh, nice little doll. Um, got some beetroot powder. Like the, uh... Now I know you can buy this. See, uh, have to make chef it. bit. No, you don't have to. You can just buy it. Yeah. This is beetroot powder. Yeah, it's just mm. that one. You can actually buy it online. So we just dry out the, uh, the beetroot puree and just blend that. So, moment of truth here with the venison. Oof, yeah, that's perfect. Oh, that's my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that looks delicious, <laughs> yeah. Must be that uh, barbecue in at the end that just... <laughs> Look at that. It's perfect, look at it. Um, one or two? <laughs> two. <laughs> See the size of us? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Couple of bits of that, and just some of this smoky marrow dressing. Just, just a, it's, on, it's more of a dressing than a, a sauce, if you will. I love the way you use the tomato seeds. And yeah, just freshens well. it up a little bit. So, give us the name of this dish. So, this is venison with um, a pablo beetroot salad, as such. Mark Birchall, everybody. <laughs> You've been looking forward to this. Dive into this one. So, t t give us a, the big shout out for the plates because the plates are spectacular. You got a lady who makes these? Yeah, we've got a uh, local lady called Cheryl, and she um, she actually made these two on a whim for me. It's my one, the ones wow. in the restaurant. For today? Yeah, just for today. Yeah, the ones in the restaurant are a touch, a touch smaller. But, uh, oh my goodness! I think I needed a button enough to get through that actually, to be honest. <laughs> it's so. Beautifully balanced. Is that okay for you? Mark Birchall, everybody. <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? 
So bad. So many things about food, you just you can explain it, but just. Just eat it. It's just mega. It's brilliant, brilliant. Right, right still to come, we've got one last dish. Uh, so join us again after the break. We'll be treating Dan Walker's for sure stopping toffee and banana knickerbocker glory. I'll see you after the break. Very different to this, but it tastes nice. <laughs> Welcome back to the last part of the show, sadly, but I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests. I'm Dan Walker. Hey! Mark and Judy here, of course. Uh, right, for my file, this... this I'm going to blame you for this one. Okay. Now we've got, we've got a gentleman here whose restaurant is now number one <laughs> and number two, flipping between another guy, best restaurants in in the whole of the UK. Now you're going to make him get him to make banana split <laughs> and a knickerbocker glory. I think this is this is a big test for you, Mark. It is. I'm, I'm <laughs> extremely <laughs> nervous. He's, he's actually quite nervous, aren't you? Yeah, I am, yeah. <laughs> get yeah. this wrong, you lose the stars. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh. That is correct. Yes, yeah. you're down to number three. So what we're going to do for the banana split? I don't know if you know this. We need almonds, flaked almonds. They're going to go in the oven. <laughs> I'm going to look after that bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening, Jeff. It's on its way. So, meanwhile, what we're going to do over here, we're going to do so barbecue bananas for our banana split. So, three bananas. Don't need to do anything with it. On the barbecue. Bang. Done. We're not right. going to peel them first. That's that one. Next. <laughs> don't peel them. No, no, don't peel them. This is a learning curve for you. OK. Yeah, just <laughs> this. <laughs> But what we're going to do is we're going to make this. This is where you get to work them. Right, we're going to then take our batter and we just mix all this lot together. So flour, a little bit of corn flour, a little bit of fizzy water. We're going to make a nice little tempura and then you're going to deep fat fry them. Uh, they're going to go in there. I'm going to roll them around in a caramel. So these are like the... the remember the bananas that you used to get in Chinese restaurants? Yeah. Mm. These are what these are. Oh. These are what these are. I'm going to mix all this lot together. And then I'm going to put the I'm chef in, to I'm work. I'm enjoying how excited Mark is. Be <laughs> <laughs> seriously, it's fascinating. He's in the game. Where does he start? Where does he start? Unknown, unknown territory. Yeah, uh, right. That's your mission. Deep fry that, Chief. Okay. There we go. All right. So we talked earlier about your, yeah. your career, and we'll talk, chat a little bit more about the book. But first of all, I mean, congratulations. New job, Channel 5. Yes, thank you. Yeah. On the news as well. I mean, you, you seem to be in a happy place. You, you... I'm really enjoying it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, like you, I was at the you know, BBC for a long time, but... I suppose whatever walk of life you're in, you, sometimes you get presented with a new challenge and you, yeah. you just want to go for it. And I think it was a massive opportunity um, and I get to do the news but also do all sorts of other new programmes well, as well. you've done what you've done throughout your career, yeah. isn't it, really? Exactly. So you, yeah. you, you're just... A bit of everything. Well, that's what you've done. We've yeah. mentioned the radio. You've, you've managed to do a bit of it, journalism and you've yeah. managed to do a bit of everything. I feel very, very thankful and very privileged as well because as a kid growing up, all essentially I wanted to do was present Match of the Day. And um, <laughs> I, I got to do that, and the little kid inside me, when they, when they played the Match of the Day music, and I was sat next to Alan Shearer, and Al Alan Shearer actually used my name in the first answer. He said, well, Dan. And the little kid inside my head was like, Alan Shearer knows my name. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the same. There's, yeah. a, there's a bit of that still going on. I still feel like I'm, I can't quite believe I'm, I'm doing this job and enjoying it as much as I do. So. I think it's the same thing to me. That was 16 years of Saturday mornings. Yeah. I mean, you've just recently done Strictly. Yeah. Sick. This is going to shock me. <laughs> 16 years since I did Strictly. No way. Wow. Oh, talent flies. I it's still just... remember in your... Um, Don't that, even die. I forget that, about that. In that <laughs> beautiful tail suit. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the thing about it is, you know as well as I do, for a person who's done it, you start off with one sequin. Yeah. Go, I'm not going to wear that, I'm going to wear black. It makes me look thinner. Yeah. Um, then you start with one sequin, and then Darren Goff wore two sequins, and that was it. By the week, week yeah. two, I was in the full, <laughs> full nine yards. Well, I, I don't oh. know about you, but I found it a real, I found it a brilliant program to be on because watching Nadia do what she was doing at close quarters, she was the best dancer on the planet for five years, and then all of a sudden she's teaching me to dance. It's like watching you guys in the kitchen. You know, I, you, even though I'm, I'm, I'll never be a chef. There's so many things you can pick up by the way that you do things and the way you, you the talk thing, about but, it. But hopefully you're going to pick this one up. So I was saving this to the end, right? I've got some caramel over here, bananas cooking over there, chefs there on there. They're perfect. They're, per they're perfect. Now, this is, this is an interesting thing. This sauce... You, you're OK so far, too. <laughs> this sauce... You can relax and have a drink now. <laughs> this, this sauce is ace. So this sauce is... I got this from... A, from when I was 18 years old, working in, working in London, and it's never changed since then. I don't know why it works, how it works, I've got no idea, but it's goat's milk. Right. So it's goat's milk, sugar, golden syrup. Now, you can put golden syrup or honey, but it's got really, really got to be golden syrup. So two different types of sugar in there. So golden syrup... Would it work with normal milk? It has to be goat's milk. No, it doesn't work, and it, this is the weird thing. If you're trying to change it with different milk, it doesn't work. If you don't put this in it, this is bicarbonate of soda, 
I got no idea. Heston Blumenthal will tell you how it works. <laughs> it's beyond me, but that goes in there. And then we take cinnamon, and you break the cinnamon in there, and you, you boil it up. Now, you've got to be careful with the, the bicarb soda, of course, because as you boil it, it sort of foams up as well. But keep whisking it, and it'll come back on itself and sort of simmer down nicely. So we've got... Saved you from those. <laughs> there we <thought. laughs> Had you back no, on that one. No, had you back, I told you. Had you, you had back donuts. on that one. That was the first mistake you were going to do on your knickerbocker glory. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on banana juice. He's been small marks been set up there. You can see it. Two right ears. <laughs> then you bring this to the boil and cook this for about 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, it turns itself into this. Yeah, don't ask me how it does it. It just happens, cos that, that then turns into that. If you can then put me the cream into your piping bag, that's all right. When well, it's slightly whipped, so a little bit of that. That goes in there. So we were talking earlier about all the things you've been doing. Yeah. And particularly one thing that I've, we've got to talk about is, is, is this book. So tell us about this book, because this, this is number four. This, yeah. We mentioned a few of the stories as well. It's a fascinating insight of, of people. Yeah, it's just... It's called Standing on the Shoulders, because... I don't know if you... There's a... Isaac Newton, the great physicist and mathematician, um, he was asked in the 17th century, he was asked, how have you managed to achieve so much? And he said, if I've seen a long way, it's because I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. So that's why I called um, the book that, because I feel that all the people in there are those sorts of people who help you to see a bit further than you can on your own. Because didn't you have an argument with your daughter about what it was, what it was supposed to be called? Yeah, she wanted... She's... <laughs> <laughs> My kids have got very, very st strong ideas about what they want it to be called, but I went for that. Because, right. you know, I, I told you earlier early about some of the people in there, but I don't know whether you've got anyone in your family or you, you probably know somebody who struggles with dementia at some point in their life. There's a chapter in there about two amazing men called Paul Harvey and Nick Harvey. And, and Paul is a musical genius, but he has dementia. And his son looks after him and takes care of him, but his dad is sort of slowly drifting away because, you know, he's, he's losing his memories. And the one thing that brings him back is his love of music. And when he sits at the piano, he might forget names and he might forget people in his family, mm. but the, the music's not in his mind, it's in his soul and in his heart and in his fingers, so he can't forget how to play the piano. And the thing that I love about it is that you've got this father and son who clearly love each other, and Nick, when he talks about his dad, he says, my dad is amazing and dementia might steal his memories, but it cannot rob him of his worth. And I just... I love spending You need time to do with a book like on that. quotes, you yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Next one. They're all coming out yeah. today, aren't they? Yeah. But they're amazing, James. And you, know, yeah. you, you must have it as well. When you spend time with people and you think, there's something about that person that I can learn something from and I can apply it to my own life. Like these two, you see? That's yeah. Two. That's, that's these two. But like it, banana it, technique. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Banana <laughs> technique. But yeah, look, I'll quiz him later. He was yeah. wondering what I was on about. Look, you take. So once the bananas are deep fried, then you roll them around in the caramel. So this is just plain sugar in the pan and then you drop them into ice-cold water. So that goes around. Make sure they're all nicely coated, like that. And then they go in ice cold. If you want to, you can roll them around with sesame seeds in there. Right. So you can do that with sesame seeds. Roll them around in there. Why have you not done that? Have you just run out of sesame seeds? I couldn't seed? be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just a bit technical. You couldn't be bothered, to be honest with you. You've had enough food today, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Too much, yeah. There's, so, yeah. there's a limit. There's a limit, Dan. But, you know, and then what we're going to do is, look, you've got these... these these crispy bananas, and then when you cut them... Yeah, that's really good. Oh, they're that like noise. chewy and soft and everything else. And then we're going to start to assemble this all up. I was saying to Judy, under pressure here, because my father-in-law, this is his favourite dessert, so he'll be watching this with great interest. But banana split cooked on the, bar on the yeah. barbecue. You've taken it up a notch already. Well, we just... We just, <laughs> we just well, in present company and all that, Our you know, banana? we just... Thank you very much. It's not going to do a fruit cocktail. Mind you, that's the next time he's on. Whoa. We're going to be doing that. Um, there you go. We just oh, look at open this. that out like that. And then, Chef, I'll let you put your fancy Michelin star scoop in there. <laughs> scoop. <laughs> scoop. Scoop. Scoop is there. Scoop. You can fill your boots oh, in there. Um, this, if you get this right, this is probably worth a round of applause. This is, okay. this this is, is Michelin star ice cream. Just, even if he puts it on there, this is worth at least 30 quid. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind a round of applause. <laughs> 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 it's like, it's the most, expa the most expensive rest. banana split. Oh, hold on, hold on. The rest. Oh, oh well, well played. <laughs> <laughs> can I have a dollop in there? <laughs> yeah. Poor man. Dolp in there. Here <laughs> And then you put these in. Another one in there. Take these. Keep going. Put them in there. 
Another one in there. Expensive ice cream. Another one in there. I forgot what did you what did you dip the bananas in? Is that just um This is this is liquid caramel. Right, okay. Let's taste these. It's it's hold on, here we go. Oh, oh. sounds crunchy. Oh, yeah. That's it. And then we've got a nice little sauce over here. We could just lift this off. This. Just put a little bit of this in there. A little bit of that so it dripples through there. Oh. Like that. <laughs> that does look delicious. And then <laughs> This will be on his menu next week. <laughs> <laughs> Look, bit of that. Bit of that. Bit of that. People will be tuning in going, he's finally lost it. James has finally <laughs> lost it. Looks amazing. Blame Dan Walker. This is what he likes, you oh, see. I'll take full responsibility. Bit of almonds over the top. And then we've got marshmallows. Marshmallows, which we stick in. On here, like that and like that. And then what you do, you've got to do with marshmallows as well, you've got to get yourself a blowtorch. You've got to toast the marshmallows while they're on there. Look how much he's enjoying himself there. <laughs> <laughs> bit of that. <laughs> a few bits of chocolate sticks. One in there, one in there. And then we just take the remaining bit of this oh, man. sauce. Over the top. Happy New Year, everybody. This is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, it. Just what you need. It's a now. thing of beauty. <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the world most expensive <laughs> Knickerbocker Glory and Banana Split. Done. <laughs>